Thank you so much, Taranj, and, and uh, what an impressive session. I'm looking forward to watching the full session um, in our recordings. Um, thank you so much for everyone who's just joining us and all that have been with us since this morning. This is session seven. As Taranj said, it's called Shared Struggle and Resilience. I'm Hamira Gilzai. I'm a cultural producer, theater practitioner, and a proud board member of Golden Thread Productions. Uh, my accessibility need is that I have a really bad sore throat, so I'll be swigging water and I have some lozenges floating around in my mouth, so please forgive me for that. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm zooming in from the traditional ancestral territory of the Gabrielino Tongva people. I pay my respects to their elders past present and emerging, and recognize their enduring connection to this land. In this session titled Share Struggle and Resilience, we as Afghan artists will share our lived experiences of 50 years of war in Afghanistan and the deep connection we feel with the Palestinian people who have mm -hmm. suffered 75 years of displacement, occupation, and war. As we gather here, let us remember also that the historical mistreatment of California Native Americans, and and the and I honor their um, resilience and strength of all Indigenous people in the United States. In a time where we are bombarded with misinformation, alternative facts, and division, it is crucial to emphasize the impossible the importance of fostering empathy and connection. It is imperative that we show allyship and solidarity, standing up to support others in their struggle. So through our stories of resilience, creativity, and even moments of paralysis, we on this panel hope to send a message to the Palestinian people that you are not alone. Thank you all for joining us today. And I'm so grateful to the incredible panelists that um, I'm sharing the space with. And I thank you all so much for um, responding when I called on you and asked you to come and participate in this um, amazing 24 hours for Palestine. I'm going to introduce the panelists in uh, alphabetical order. Alex Milatmal is a writer and unionized software engineer. Alex is a pushcart nom nominated writer who believes in Palestinian liberation. Their creative work centers on conflict, reconciliation, liberatory politics, and mixed race identity, loneliness, and speculative ethics. Their writings have been featured in a variety of magazines and publications, including The Margins, what is Afghan Punk Rock Anyway, and Kokash Review. Recently, they published Erasure Poems in the anthology for the 2023 Wertheimer Worth Writer Art Galleries exhibition, Emergency, Afghan Lives Beyond the Forever War. Our next panelist is Ghazal Samizai. Ghazal was born in Kabul, Afghanistan, and was raised in rural Washington state. Their art reflects the complexities of culture, nationality, and gender. Their work has been exhibited at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Linden Museum in Germany, De Young Museum in San Francisco, and Peabody Essex Museum in Massachusetts. Gazelle is the recipient of the San Francisco Arts Commission Artist Grant. They are also the director of the Worth Rider Art Gallery at UC Berkeley. Next, Mateen. Mateen Maulawizada is a social entrepreneur and activist. He has founded, co-founded Afghan Hands to empower Afghan women through skills in embroidery, literacy, and livelihood. Mateen's work with Afghan Hands has been recognized by Anderson Cooper 360, Oprah Winfrey, Katie Couric, and People. 
Mateen is also a makeup artist for celebrities like Angelina Jolie, Jessica Chastain, and Claire Danes. Their work has been featured in Elle, Marie Claire, Glamour, Harper's Bazaar, and Allure. And I have a confession to make that whenever I'm going to see Mateen, I'm terrified as to how my makeup looks, despite the fact that he has assured me many times he doesn't care how my makeup looks. Um, so I'm so glad you're here, Mateen. You're always perfect. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, last but not least is Zulaiha Zora Shaja. They are an experimental filmmaker and Fulbright scholar. Zulaiha's artistic practice explores geopoetics, communal storytelling, grief work, and memory transmission. They hold an MFA, an art video from Syracuse University, and their work has been exhibited at the Everson Museum of Art, Goethe Institute, Governor's Island, and the National Art Gallery, The Palace. Recently, their ephemeral fabric photo book was presented at the Printed Matter New York Art Book Fair 2024 and the Center for Art Research and Alliances. I'm so thankful to all of you. There's so much talent and goodwill and generosity in the screen with me. Um, I'm going to start the first question um, that's going to be posed to all the panelists. And that is, as Afghans who have either directly or indirectly been affected or have experienced war, how do you connect? How does this experience connect you to the people of Palestine and what their struggle has been in the past 75 years and is now? So, um, Mateen, if I can ask you to maybe start this kick us off by answering this question? Sure. Um, I left Af Afghanistan in 1982. And by that time, there was a full on, uh, full on fighting going on uh, outside Kabul. And this was when the Soviets were bombing uh, villages. My, some of my family lived in a village in Panjshir Valley. And uh, I lost 13 cousins in one bombing. Uh, I mean, I was a teenager and it was extremely painful. Um, it wasn't until 10 years later when I was already in the States and I was finishing college and, um, you know, going to grad school that I, I remember putting a spider outside and I realized that when my cousins were killed, I could have gone and killed someone a human being a russian um so the, the pain that comes with war is is irreparable and it's it takes a very long time of calm and uh luxury of being at a peaceful space in order to heal a little bit and to really reflect on on how bad it could get um so i really do feel for for what's happening with people in, in war, they can't see clearly and all they want to do is to revenge. So Palestinians with the amount of loss that they have been facing in the continuous bombing and the trauma of it, I've only witnessed bombing for an hour max in Kabul when, um, when the coup happened and there were helicopters that were firing at the um, at the uh, palace and my school was next to the palace and then you know we could see the palace and the and the um, and the helicopters when I got home um, it goes into your bones to this day I cannot watch fireworks uh, loud noises really kind of triggers me so to imagine what Palestinians are going through day in and day out for um, this time around for 10 months and the amount of loss is unimaginable because even, you know, in the wars that we have been, uh, that has been for so long and in, in, in continuous, uh, it wasn't compacted the way it is. The Gaza, Gaza war and also, you know, the West Bank, what they're facing. 
Um, so the injustice and the inhumanity of it, and also this this compacted trauma, daily trauma, day and night, um, is something that unless you really experienced it viscerally with your body, you cannot imagine. And um, I really hope that people could put themselves in the shoes of people that are growing up in war um, to really understand what what they're going through and they could if they could imagine it i don't think it's possible to imagine because when i explain it to to americans for example that have never been in war they don't understand that noise they don't understand what it does to a body you know so how- that, that day you're talking about the the coup in afghanistan um yeah i would i remember that and i really didn't realize how much it had damaged me until the 2021 withdrawal of the U.S. from Afghanistan and seeing all the people escaping. Um, so it takes it takes a long time to um, see how you've been wounded. And I do have to say that since, you know, middle of October until today, your Instagram is continually filled with correction, setting the record straight about what is happening in Palestine, what Israel is doing, um, what's happening in Gaza. And I really appreciate how you have not taken a day off in how you are expressing and, you know, what you feel. I can I can tell you that you feel the pain. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for doing that and, and reminding some of us who are not active on social media, how important it is to be there and share these things. Um, Zulaikha John, um, may, are you moved to answer this uh, question? Yeah. Um, my experience of war, I think, has been fairly indirect, as I didn't physically, um, I wasn't in Afghanistan, I wasn't born or raised there. Um, I, I feel like um, I've been witnessing um, political violence and the dehumanizing, uh, the same kind of waves and patterns of dehumanizing groups and stripping people of civil liberties since 9-11. Um, I had a lot of unsolicited conversations where um, Americans were projecting um, their hatred, disgust, and general ignorance about Afghanistan, uh, especially with the recent withdrawal. Um, and I find like Americans are really angry about the war and more so apathetic now, um, not understanding with, like most people, like uh, even me, like why was the U.S. there, especially for so long? Why was there so much loss of life? And I find that anger is directed towards Afghans as opposed to the U.S. government. Um, and I, that's something I really have trouble with. And I get re- I get angry about that fact. Um, and I think it's. That anger is directed towards the people because there's this deep racism of um, that's like enabled by the trope of the graveyard of the of uh, civilizations of our people not being able to govern ourselves, um, and it, it's something that really frustrates me. There's so much displacement, uh, further violence with the transference of power to the Taliban. Um, and it's like the withdrawal was this reset button where Americans like uh, willfully have collective amnesia as a way to absolve themselves. Um, or and like I can't even talk to my professors with PhDs that are like they claim to be experts in Middle Eastern studies um, or people refuse to understand the role of um foreign occupation or the U.S.'s role in the current state of Afghanistan and destabilization of other countries in general. like They can't even have that conversation. And I find um, the language um, that's being used in the media um, towards Palestine is really similar, where um, Black, Brown, and Muslim folks and children are viewed as potential terrorists and enemies. Um, the same kind of trope and misinformation where it's like, oh, Palestine didn't exist or they're, they weren't progressive enough to form a government or as a civilization, they like nothing was happening there or there's always been fighting in that area. Um, that kind of trope, like I, it's as violent as the trope of um, that's like stuck to Afghanistan. 
um, which uh, is like a, a similarity that I immediately saw. Um, pink washing is something that's really similar, and the Western feminist uh, take on um, on the occupation. Um, during uh, the George Floyd protests, I think it really solidified in me when I was out on the streets in the protest and reading a lot of the signs, um, seeing how um, how interconnected. Um, it was like what seeing the relationship between the weapons uh, that were being exported from the U.S. and the training of the Israeli occupation forces and the NYPD or other U.S. police forces. Um, seeing that during that time, something that like, really solidified with me. Um, and I, there was this really profound moment where um, on Twitter and so social media in general, um, Palestinians were giving advice to um, Black folks that were subject to the same tear gas that was being manufactured in the U.S. that were being used on Palestinians and how to protect them, like how to protect yourself or um, how to recover from like, having tear gas uh, in your eyes. Um, and seeing that solidarity um, was something that was really beautiful to me. Um, but during the time, I think there was a lot of conversations about um, abolition, specifically with the police. And I was like trying to push people further and thinking about um, even like military abolition um, or uh, critiquing U.S. foreign policy. Um, so it's like I I'm constantly thinking about my position as an Afghan, but also someone that was born and raised here um, and as someone that tries to refute um like my americanness i'm like I, I understand i was raised here and understanding what and even by living here you participate in certain things with your taxes so trying to critique my own position um when thinking about uh palestine was has been something really important for me yeah one of the things that i see a lot is the othering that the afghans the palestinians they're different from us. They're not as this, or they're doing this to their women. So therefore they don't deserve the things that we have. And, and that really is something that um, I think takes a lot of uh, time and, and patience to uh, explain. And I don't really actually know if actually it makes a difference other than forums like this, where you see people of that part of the world who are educated, articulate, doing amazing things, speak up. So thank you so much for sharing that. So my Um Alex, uh, may I invite you to answer the same question? Do you want me to repeat it? Or are you good? Yeah, I can kind of rephrase it a little bit. So I think the question was about direct and indirect experiences of war and how that impacts and shapes our perception of the Palestinian struggle as Afghans. And I really appreciate what folks have shared so far. And I, I think it's a, a good segue into some of the things that I wanted to talk about because I'm half Afghan and I... I am am like at once a contradiction to to that kind of um thing that you were just talking about um about like uh there being a a strict dichotomy between these things um and I I think a lot about that impossibility but I think um more so in the last few years particularly around the withdrawal um, the U.S. withdrawal in 2021, I've been thinking a lot about how I have, I would not be possible without a legacy of U.S. imperialism. Um, my, my maternal grandparents met in Germany when my grandfather was stationed there in the U.S. Air Force. Um, and my father met my mother in the U.S. when he came on, like, a student program that was really focused on like state state building and diplomacy and and kind of training um afghans in in that kind of um way of wielding imperialism so um he came from afghanistan to study here to the us yeah to to the to the very midwest of of the country 
Um, and so it, there's just like, there's no part of my life that it feels like U.S. imperialism doesn't touch. And I think that it is therefore like a responsibility for me to understand how to um, metastasize and like churn with that and, and do something with that. Um, I think similarly to what Zuleika Jean was saying, um, you know, I also came to a political consciousness, you know, after 9-11 in the very center of, of rural America. Um, and there was a lot of really wonderful anti-war organizing that was happening and that was, um, you know, from that, from that kind of 2001 all the way through my college, um, my college years. And that was really an opportunity to learn from folks who were committed to an anti-war struggle with the, both the occupation in Afghanistan, but also Iraq. Um, and that's kind of around the same era when I started learning about the Palestinian struggle as well. Um, I think that there's something to be said about showing up and being in the struggle with one another um, that was invaluable then. Um, and I think, yeah, will continue to be invaluable as we, as we move forward. I don't think that these... Um, this kind of violence doesn't go easily. Um, and so I think we're in it for the long haul together. Thanks. Yeah, it's it's interesting how you both mentioned 9-11. Um, you know, for me, I was living this really all-American life. I was in my 30s when 9-11 happened. Okay, guys, don't calculate my age. Just listen to what I'm saying. Um and it really woke me to my Afghanness and, and who I am. And, you know, we in the Bay Area were in the hotbed of everything, all the intelligence that was going on, how the Afghans were in so many different ways being monitored and, and scrutinized. And it was a very, very impactful time. And it kind of woke me up from this lull of, oh, I'm living this great American life and, you know, achieving the American dream to, oh, no, I am never going to be a full Afghan. My passport, full American, my passport says I was born in Afghanistan and that's always going to be there. So um, I, I'm. it's good to hear how it has affected different generations and, and these stories that we normally don't get a platform to share. Um, Hazal John, may I invite you to share a little bit about your experience? You obviously were born in Afghanistan, so like Martin and I maybe experienced the war in some way. Yeah, um, so we left shortly after I was born. Um, and so unlike my sister, who's seven years older than me, I don't have any memories. But I do remember like as a very young child, like, like preschool or early elementary school, like really feeling this desire for like equality and like being very, I don't know, at such a young age concerned about like global injustices. So I think that, you know, even if I wasn't like necessarily conscious of what was happening, I think I was absorbing you know, whatever conversations were happening between my parents. Um, and I think that's allowed me to like have more empathy for other people's struggles like the Palestinian struggle. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's like you were talking about how it takes a long time to heal those wounds. And I think that even for some of us who were not you know, necessarily firsthand experiencing war, um, the effects of it definitely 
passed down to the generations. And my teen John was talking about, you know, not liking the sound of fireworks and I'm the same. (laughs) And it's interesting. My daughter who's three can't, she's so scared of fireworks. And I always think about, you know, those effects of like intergenerational trauma. Um, So yeah, just to say that these things have a really lasting effect. And I agree with Alex that it's important for us to, to come together and support one another. Thank you so much. Um, Yeah, I actually remember my teacher John right before 4th of July, you said, not all of us love fireworks or some post that effect. And I'm sure no, I- it was, it was a poem actually from a Palestinian poet that said, you have to have you have to have lived a different type of life in order to enjoy fireworks. That's right. It, was, it really resonated with me because it was it it always um, it shatters me every time I, I run away during Fourth of July and I, I I go as far away from the cities as I can in order not to hear it. Um, the one thing that I want to touch base on since we talked about nine eleven and the racism. Uh, that came with it. Um, I remember when Americans were trying to get rid of Taliban and were getting gearing up to invade Afghanistan, they were showing the Northern, Northern Alliance, which is basically Mujahideen from the past that they have packaged. And I remember every time the camera was on Northern Alliance, they were sandy haired guys with pakols, not a turban, um, green eyed, blue eyed, like light complexion. And every time they showed Taliban, which was against American at that time, um, they showed these darker men and with like, with like coal in the eyes and like really exotic looking and so different than, than Americans. And I realized that later, uh, when, when every time there was a clash with Israel and Palestine, they would do the same thing. They would always show the Eastern European, um, Eastern European Israelis, because they looked like, you know, Americans. They looked like us in a way that to, it, that's what, that's the, the feeling they wanted to bring. And I realized how this brainwashing is blatant, but no one talks about it. Um, and it's the media is completely complicit with it, and it's. Um, and it's been going on forever, obviously. Um, but after Afghanistan, that's when I, when my eyes opened, and I saw how they manipulate, um, how they manipulate uh, consent for wars by showing people that are like Americans. Um, that way, they can actually go ahead and bomb, bomb the bomb a country and kill a bunch of people um, that looks like the other. Yeah, just like when when the um, Russians attacked the Ukrainians, you know, I think there was a journalist that said, oh, these people are like us, they look like us, they could be our children that are running away, not yeah. like those Afghans. I don't know if they called Afghans out by name, but, it you is. know, oh, they, so not like those barbarians. Iraqis and Afghans, they, he said yeah. it, yeah. Yeah, so definitely this is... Um, implicit and explicit bias that we are all influenced by. Thank you for, for sharing that, Mateen John. Um, so Zulaikha John, um, you know, as a filmmaker, you explore communal storytelling and memory. Um, do you incorporate the narratives of both Afghans and Palestinians struggle? And if so, what do you hope to achieve and highlighting resilience through these shared histories? Um, I focus primarily on Afghans in diaspora and um, the microcosm of my family um, and like uh, exploring personal and collective moments of rupture. And then that's usually like a departure point for um, broader issues. Um, recently I made an essay film where I was, uh, incorporating Palestinian struggles. Um, the, the film, like it's, it's like a huge entanglement of so many different, uh, traumas and like layered histories. Um, 
the I guess the personal rupture I had um I was going through something personally, which coincided with the withdrawal and uh, focusing on helping a lot of my family members to uh, leave the country and really just feeling powerless from uh, some of the actions uh, during that time. Um, And everything I went through during that time, I feel like I repressed. Um, So with the essay film that I made recently, I was like trying to explore why did I repress so much um, during that time and like trying to get to the heart of what I was feeling and uh, for the next few years, like unraveling everything from those last. A lot of grief um, during the time of the withdrawal. So I turned that grief and I was like, really, uh, I was like, I need to get this out of my body. Uh, I was incredibly stressed and I was having a lot of like somatic reactions to just storing everything inside. Um, I did a sonic performance where I had collected names from um, Afghan civilians who uh, were killed during uh, U.S. drone strikes Um, And I was with a group of uh, friends and artists that I trusted where we were calling out the names and we invited the audience to participate um, in an attempt to like collectivize our grief. Um, And we invited that people to call the names that we had pre-selected and also call on any names that they thought of in the moment where they just wanted to remember someone. Um, And there was that performance, like it led to like this attempt for me to release a lot of trauma ended up creating a really traumatic moment because there was a family in the audience and one of the women, um, one of the daughters, she, um, she went into a, like a catatonic state and uh, became possessed by the spirit of her deceased husband, whose name she called during the performance. And I was like in shock because I didn't think something like this would have happened. There were the first audience members that participated too. So I was like, I didn't know how to handle my grief and also hers in this moment. Um, And that like act of possession, thinking about it as like a physical possession of your body and also um, thinking about like material possessions, haunted bodies and spaces ended up being like the departure point for the longer film, which is like 32 minutes. Um, And I start off where I'm looking at my repressed body and then looking at the sonic performance, the sonic, the sacred space in the history of the museum we're performing in. And then this like continued repression um, and like uh, reactivation of trauma where I was witnessing like the cyclical uh, history and violence in Afghanistan and Palestine over um, over the years. Um, yeah, the, like the f- film, it ended up being a lot. It's a lot of entanglements and layered shared histories. Um, I think we have a five minute clip or an ex- excerpt. It's the first five minutes um, of the whole piece. So it gives a little bit of context of what the performance was, what the space we were in, um, and just posing some questions about um possession like in a broader scale a few weeks ago i came across a video of a man encountering a jinn in a cave using a stone it looks like the man in the back is immediately paralyzed the man on the left then points to a cloaked figure squatting in a dark crevice any images of the jinn have been redacted. The title of this video is auto-translated from Arabic to The greatest kings of the jinn attend, see what happened. The adventurer brings an old man in the subsounds of the earth, watch the wonder. The comments on the video suggest the man in the back is bait to show the power the stone has in summoning the jinn. The adventurer, Ibrahim al-Salti, has 434 videos on YouTube around possessions. In his videos, he holds the power to summon and expel the jinn. The other becomes possessed or reoccupied with another. The body is frozen and powerless, but still observing in horror. I immediately thought of a recent possession I witnessed.
occupied bodies, inhabited rooms, stolen homes, graves without bodies. Who holds the power to possess another being or space? Who holds the power to summon intangible bodies and histories? Who holds the power to remember names or memories to call upon? To walk into a space and access all of its layered history? Wow. Oh, I When I first saw your film, I was just so moved on so many levels. And in this five minutes, what a gift that you shared it with us. Thank you so much. Um, well, I will, I will go on next to um, another amazing artist, Ghazal John. Um, how do you use your platform to highlight the impact of the war on Palestine? And can you share about any projects that you've done recently that showcases Palestinian resilience? Yeah, um, a lot of my own artwork deals with my identity as an Afghan American. And I have several projects that do deal with the impact of war and displacement that I think are also applicable to Palestinians. But as far as projects that are specific to Palestinians, um, I recently co-curated an exhibit of Palestinian artists at the Worth Rider Art Gallery at UC Berkeley. 
Um, I co-curated that with Tamar Beja and Asma Kazmi. And um, this happened this last spring, February. And it was, I think, just a way to kind of elevate those voices, especially because I was witnessing, particularly in art circles, like how many people were being censored, their programs were being canceled because they said one, like the smallest thing in support of Palestinians. Um, so I thought it was a really important time um, to give those artists more um, space to come forward. Um, historically, even outside of this conflict, um, Palestinian artists have been censored and their shows have been canceled. Um, but it was... It was a little bit, I don't know, a little bit stressful because I didn't know like how the reaction would be. Um, but we ended up being very fortunate. It was very well received. We had lots of other departments on campus co-sponsor and, um, you know, teachers were bringing their classes to help to use it like as an educational aid. And I saw that um, I think there were a lot of people on campus who wanted to express something in support of the Palestinians, but like weren't sure how. And, you know, it always gets kind of complicated when you're in a department and in an institution. And so I think a lot of people really saw this space as, I don't know, so a place where they could kind of just like, you know, breathe a sigh that they could like be in a space on campus where it was okay to talk about Palestine, say the word, um, and really look at the, the intimate and very nuanced stories of all the artists um, who are sort of reclaiming histories and archives that have been systematically erased by the Zionist project. I apologize, I missed that exhibit. <laughs> I was traveling so much and it's looked so amazing. Um, and, you know, it was sometimes as an Afghan and not being Arab, um, I feel a little conflicted as to how much I can say in my um, feel. It, Am I an imposter who's pretending that I care? Um, so it's it it is something that um, I struggle with. Is you know, do I have to say I'm Afghan? I don't speak Arabic, you know, but I've been through war and I understand. So I always feel I still haven't found the balance. Um, but I feel like art is an amazing way to communicate, and that's one of the things that has been so. Um, fortunate for me is that in this uh, year, 2024, uh, Golden Thread that I'm uh, a board member of has dedicated the whole season to Palestine. So by supporting the work of the artists that we're showcasing, I feel like I am um, participating in a genuine way. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Alex, you know, when we talked a little bit, you were saying that there are things that you wanted to do, you know, artistically, but you were a little, you know, had a hard time working on it. But then you've done all this amazing work of like fundraising on social media, you've been out there speaking up. Um, and most of the time your writing touches on conflict and liberatory politics. Um, so I was wondering, you can either talk a little bit about why you've been stuck in the zone of where you wanted to do some work and you aren't able to, or how has the war in Palestine influenced your work and your perception of shared struggles between Afghan and Palestinian communities? Sure, thank you. I'll, I'll try to keep my answer brief because I know we're running short on time, but um, I did want to speak a little bit to just a feeling of being a little bit creatively stuck over the last um several months and um 
I, um, at the beginning of October, I was working on this project that was all about thinking about Afghan speculative fiction, um, in set in the future. And it, it was a project that was long time coming. Um, and then October happened. And, um, even though the, the, project is like in a lineage that was started by Palestinian writers doing their own kind of speculative fiction um didn't feel like quite the time and it kept not feeling like quite the time to work on a project like this and I I guess I just want to briefly say like that is okay it is okay to put down work and pick something else up in its stead and we learn something by participating in protests, by participating in fundraising campaigns, by observing, um, by amplifying the work that Palestinian artists have been able to continue doing throughout this, which is just like kind of blows me over when I think about it. Um, th that is that is a creative work as well. Um, and it will it will feed into our work in the future. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to like give voice to um, this idea that that participating in the politics like is a creative act in and of itself. Absolutely, yes. Um, and I'm really excited. Hopefully, next time we have a marathon of something, you can talk about what what has uh, been your retrospective work that has come out of this um Martin John you know it's ironic that we have three female panelists but I'm asking the male panelists about women um but you know what can I say your work with Afghan hands has empowered women through skills and education I know in talking to you you really loved those women you connected with them you knew their stories and such and, you know, women and girls and boys are always the collateral damage in war. Um, so how do you see the experiences of Afghan women in war-torn Afghanistan and the current apartheid against the Afghan women and the struggles of the Palestinian women and how these shared experiences has a potential for fostering greater solidarity? Um, with Afghan hands, when I first went to Af Afghanistan, um, I saw something that I never expected. I mean, I knew that, that the rate of illiteracy was really rampant and it was unimaginable, and it still is in Afghanistan. But when I went back in a, around 2004, it was shocking that two generations of women have not been to school, even if they wanted to. Um, so you would have these uh, classes filled, filled with first graders and then there would be a woman in her 30s sitting there and a woman in, that was like a teenager would be sitting in the first grade. It wasn't all five-year-old or seven-year-olds. Um, so that was happening a lot in schools. And the whole point for Afghan hands was to, to create jobs for these women that could revive uh, dying arts, um, which embroidery is something that a lot of women knew. And I really do see the connection with Afghan women doing embroidery that was dying in our culture. And, and we try to bring that back because machine was taking over. And that's one of the saddest part of uh, colonialism is that they try to westernize the countries. They bring in factory farming, they bring in machineries in order to replace humans. So there were these intricate handori gan, which is at the front of, you know, garments in Afghanistan. They were all done with machines in Kabul when I went there. Um, you could find very few women that was still doing handwork. So we we tried to incorporate this dying art. Embroidery to me is, is an artistic endeavor. It's not just a craft. Um, so when I when I when I saw these women reviving these dying Sudanese art or 
Pandori, Duzi art, um, and even Tetris that they are using in Afghanistan. They make a lot of uh, prayer rugs from Tetris. Um, I saw Palestinians go through the same struggle, um, except Palestinian women are not as shunned away from the society for long. They, they are active participants. Um, and it was really heartwarming to see the artists that are using Tatris in, in the West, they were uh, offering online classes and seminars in order to, to teach and keep the tradition going. Um, so these symbols predates Islam, predates, you know, it, it's, it's, it's something that comes with the culture, with the indigenous people that, that grew up there and it's, it's their environment they see. Um, so they weave and they embroider and they make things that are reflect a reflection of, of their heritage. And it's really sad that, you know, these wars are erasing it. And the only things you can find are these old pieces that are in the museums, um, or you can find a few things that are sold in, in like flea market type of environment. So for me, it was, was important to bring in that art that was dying in a luxury form. Because to me, if you are spending money and you are justifying spending money, it's much better for that money to go to someone who actually made it, made a product. And also the product should reflect um, the pride and the, the beauty of the culture. And to me, luxury in the future is going to be that it's not going to be logos it's not going to be you know these products that are made in china and then packaged in in milan or in paris and then sold for a lot of money to me the luxury should be the tetris pieces the handmade olive oil the handmade um skincare products that are coming out in palestine the soaps those are those should be the luxury items and and for me I see Palestinians are going through the same struggle of keeping those parts of their culture alive because fine artists can, can express themselves even if they're squashed in museums and they're not, you know, their, their work is, is um, canceled or if, if it's a writer, their book, they're canceled in book fairs, but at least they are trying to create all the time. Um, and it's usually a, a a modern medium, but the traditional art, which is weaving and embroidery, uh, calligraphy, these are arts that are that are literally dying um, because print and uh, machines are taking over. So um, that's basically what what my my uh, the correlation that I see with with Afghan hands and also with Palestinian women, which I really do dream to go someday and and, and 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 revive something like that in there as well so afghan hands to to service to be the service of um you know palestinian people which are so dear to me can i come with you <laughs> absolutely <laughs> uh, that is so important because a big part of colonization is to kill the culture of the indigenous people so when they don't have an identity they don't have um, a, a heritage, then they no longer can connect to the land, the, to where um, they rightly belong. Um, we have a couple more minutes, and I want to acknowledge all the beautiful and amazing work you all are doing. Um, but I have a feeling... Um, even just from my own experience of posting about this event on my social media, I would get like one or two likes. And mostly it was from either the organizers or one of you guys. Like people are feeling uncomfortable enough about 24 whole hours dedicated to Palestine that they wouldn't even like my, my post, you know, promoting it. So this is for anyone who wants to jump in and, and answer, you know, have you faced any backlash for your support of the Palestinian people? And how do you um, deflect that or or absorb it and, and continue still doing your activism? So whoever wants to jump in, just go ahead. 
Okay, go ahead, Matija. I'll go since the ladies are quiet right now. <laughs> um, the uh, I did. Uh, there was a lot of backlash. There was a lot of uh, threatening DMs on my Instagram um, that I would never work in this field anymore because I work in Hollywood and and, and with actresses. Um, you'll never have a job in this field again or, you know, things like that. And it always came from people that were in PR. Um, they're the gatekeepers for everything in Hollywood. Um, and my work did dry out, um, but it was something that was worth giving up in order to be able to, you know, save my humanity and my soul. Wow. Um, so, yeah. I how amazing that you not only continued your work, but, you know, compromised your livelihood. And that is what is so inspiring um, is for those people um, who have, who have shown their allyship and solidarity um, and, and stood up for what they believe, despite whatever pressures they were feeling or, uh, objections and I did read on some of the your posts that um, people were saying negative things and actually I also saw in Ghazal and when you posted about this um, uh, 24 hour Palestine there was somebody who said unfollowed and I was like what yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I think they were Afghan. I think they're Iranian, maybe. Oh, okay, okay. Um, did you, how How was your experience in um, UC Berkeley? I know you said that it was actually a good, safe environment. So that's actually a positive story that you can maybe share with us. Yeah, um, as I said, we were kind of prepared for the worst. I had created like a safety handout for the interns who watched the gallery in case any, you know, protest came and it became violent. Um, but we were really lucky that we had such a great reception. And I've been there for about two years now. And I would say that it was the highest attended exhibit we've ever had. So it was really great to see that support. And a lot of people expressed their appreciation um, for having the exhibit and having access to that. That's it gives me so much faith in the Bay Area, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what you all are feeling in Brooklyn, and, and I think Salif al you're in Virginia, um, but the, the San Francisco, Berkeley, um, I think we still have the opportunities to, you know, speak up about things that we care about. Um, thank you all so much for sharing your deep felt experiences, your passion, your trauma with us today. I hope that we have been able to send the message to our Palestinian um, brothers and sisters that we're with them. So I'm gonna move on now and introduce the next session, which is um, going to be amazing. It's being moderated by the wonderful Andrea Saf. Uh, and it's entitled, A Moon Will Rise from Darkness, Poetry for Palestine. And uh, the session is about internationally acclaimed poets from, poets from Palestine, Lebanon, and the diaspora in the United States, who have come together for a special reading of their poetry, which has for decades uplifted the stories, voices, resilience, beauty, and resistance of the Palestinian people. Poetry for Palestine illuminates the soul of a people, tells the truths of lived experiences, and celebrates the rising global movement toward liberation, even in these dark hours. Now we give the floor to Andrea, and thank you all for being here.